be here today in the uh, house of God to worship together today. We welcome everybody that's with us here in person and also all those that are watching with us online. If you're with us online this morning, just say hello. We'd love to know who's worshiping with us. And we want to make sure everybody feels welcome here at the church. And please know, even if you are a guest with us, you are always welcome here at Canova United Methodist Church. I'm going to turn it over to you, Eugene, because we'll begin our worship. We have some opportunities for ministry this week. Uh, a couple announcements affecting that. If you'll notice in the bulletin, it lists next Saturday the M&M brunch. And it is, it had been scheduled to be a breast cancer awareness type brunch with a pink lemonade stand up at uh, Joe's store and to support the cancer research. But we found out Thursday the speaker and her daughter could not be here and something that unforeseen that couldn't be helped. So they're going to try to reschedule that. And since it has, it's too close to schedule someone else, the M&M brunch for next Saturday has been canceled. Uh, however, the next scheduled M&M brunch is in three weeks. The speaker will be our own Julie Tennant. And we will have Marsha Hurst Thompson as our soloist for some music. So November 12th will be the next M&M &M brunch. The one for this Saturday has had to be canceled. Uh, so everybody mark that on your calendar. And another announcement, if you'll notice on Wednesday there's a snack supper prepared by the Wesleyan class scheduled for 5.30. The menu will be spaghetti, salad bread, dessert and drink. No charge, donation only, but what we would ask you to do today is when the uh, sign-up sign sheets are passed, the attendance sheets, if you will please indicate on that because if we don't have enough interest, we won't do it. So if everyone will mark, if you attend, plan to attend, and how many, and by the end of the service, the ladies are going to count. And if there's enough, we will say, yes, we're doing it. And if there's not enough, we'll say, no, not this week, maybe another week. We'll figure it out. So if you plan on attending the Wednesday night snack supper at 5.30, please sign your, after your name, how many, and we'll let you know by the end of the service. Okay. And if you'll notice, the senior high that evening have a a youth hangout and choir and adult Bible study. So if you plan on attending any of those, it'd be a good way to come and get your supper and stay for Bible study and youth. So there you go. All right. Anybody have any other announcements they'd like to put? Yes. No youth or children's this evening. Okay, and next week will be a busy week. I noticed in one of the announcements it listed that we you would load your float and save a lot. Is that correct? No, that's incorrect. Okay, food fair. Okay, it's still food fair. I don't know if anybody noticed that, but I did. And I thought that's a stretch. That's a long way to ride to get in line. So. So this float for the night of the Alphabet parade will load a food fair. Okay, well we have next Sunday to announce that, but I was just making sure. Okay, anybody else have any announcements? If not, uh, if you would stand for our call to worship. Power and might and majesty belong to God who created and is creating. The thanks be to God for God's mighty wonders. Like the image of the powerful wind and heavens as a garment, God's majesty is revealed in all creation. We look around us and the wonders and marvel and the infinite variety and beauty which God has are we that God should pay attention to us? We are God's beloved children, the stewards who God has selected to care for the world. Amen. Now if you'll join me in the opening prayer. Lord, everywhere we look, we see the imprint of your 
are part of that created order, meant to be stewards and not destroyers. Prepare us to work for you in ministries of peace and justice. Amen. Our opening hymn is on page 159 and on the screen. Uh, lift high the cross.
地方。Eternal and loving God, we come before you today on this day in which we celebrate uh, the children of the church, but also the laity uh, of the church. As Children's Sabbath and laity are on the same Sunday this year, we celebrate the work of, uh, of the laity throughout this church and we volunteer their time and, uh, and give so much to, to make sure this place uh, continues to, to run like a, a well also just to, through the ministries and the missions uh, and through their time on, on administrative committees. Lord, we, we can't thank everybody enough for all the time and for the gifts that they use uh, to make this wonderful church uh, share in the, in the words of your Son, Jesus Christ, and go out into the community to spread the good news. Lord, we also thank you again for the gifts that you've given the children. Uh, what a blessing it was to see them, to hear what their favorite parts about uh, church was, and uh, and just to, to see their smiling faces week in and week out, and, and how they're excited to be here, uh, Lord, and to, and to show not just the congregation the future of the church, but also just to show the world what faith is like in the eyes of a child, and, and to show the world what, how great it is to be a follower and disciple of you. Lord, we thank you for uh, the celebrations that you have bestowed upon us this week, uh, that we're thankful for those that have been suffering under COVID uh, the last couple of weeks that are recovering and are able to be with us uh, today. We're thankful everybody is safe and healthy and, uh, and are able to get out. We're thankful for uh, to, to seeing videos of, uh, of little ones walking uh, and the celebrations of uh, seeing children walk for the very first time. And we're thankful for the exciting news of, uh, of future additions to the family and, and new babies being uh, being born and we're just thankful Lord for uh, the celebration of uh, of the news that has been shared for, with Sean and Samantha. We ask that you uh, continue to, to shower us with joys of, uh, of, of weddings and celebrations and of course baptisms as well but joys of uh, of good news that we get from maybe the doctor or celebrating our, our children, our grandchildren, uh, the missions and the ministries of the church. But Lord, we're just thankful for all the good things you're doing throughout our lives each and every day. Lord, we have prayed for many uh, out loud today. People that are, are suffering with COVID, those that are uh, getting ready to have surgeries, those that are dealing with uh, breast cancer, for those that are, are cursing for results, uh, from the doctor just trying to figure out what is going on. We thank what we ask for prayers for uh, for those that will be traveling uh, throughout this week, uh, for those that uh, are just just in need of, of prayer, in need of uh, comfort, and in need of encouragement, Lord. We lift all those folks up to you, all the names that are on our prayer concerns list, Lord. You know their names, you know uh, what prayers they need. We know you know that if they need healing, you know if they need comfort, you know if they need love, you know if they need for us just to reach out to you. Lord, we lift all those folks up to you. And for all those unspoken prayer requests on our hearts and minds today, Lord, we ask that you would, you would hear those prayers as well. Lord, we ask for your divine presence to continue to guide us in worship today. Guide us uh, as we hear music, as we hear the sermon, as we, as we read your word aloud, as we, uh, as we go out in fellowship and enjoy and celebration, and as we go out in the world. Lord. May your son Jesus continue to go before us to guide us in what we say and do. And may we become disciples of Jesus Christ. And now let us join together in praying the prayer he taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'm going to turn it to our hand.
at our service where we give back to God through our tithes uh, and our offering. Uh, if you would like to make a gift to the church today, you can give in person through the offering plate as the ushers passes around. You can also give through the mail and uh, through our electronic giving option, which can be found uh, on the website uh, through Tidely. Uh, of course, you can check that out, and it's easy. It's easy to use, and you can set that up however you want. If you want to do it weekly, monthly, or however you'd like to do that, that is an option uh, for you. So we thank you for your continued generosity uh, and your gifts. Loose change uh, offering this month goes toward our caring and sharing uh, ministry, which is a wonderful program that helps take meals to those that uh, are in need of meals, uh, and it's, it's just a wonderful ministry, uh, which we hope to learn more about uh, in the coming months. But uh, just a kind of sidebar for what's coming up, and we're excited uh, for that ministry. So if you'd like to give, we encourage you, and we thank you. Uh, and I'm going to call our ushers to come forward uh, as we hear from special.
Spirit. And he poured out upon the gifts that have been given freely this day. And upon all, this, all the people here at the church and all those watching online. May these gifts go out and spread the good news of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Savior, our Rock and our Redeemer. In His name we pray. Amen. 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 verses 1 through 8. Uh, I'll be reading from the message translation, or as we call it in our new Sunday school class, the MSG, which I think is actually quite comical. I mean, it actually is the... Uh, <laughs> the uh, I forget the word. What was that? <laughs> anyway, if you, see, if you see MSG, it's not MSG that's in food, it's MSG, <laughs> the message. But, but I, had to, I, I laughed every time I hear it. So this version is more of a paraphrased modern translation, so it may sound a little different. But in Luke's Gospel, Jesus told them a story showing that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and never quit. He said there was once a judge in some city who never gave God a thought or cared anything about people. A widow in that city kept after him. My rights are being violated. Protect me. He never gave her the time of day, but after this went on and on. He said to himself, I care nothing what God thinks, even less what people think. But because this widow won't quit badgering me, I'd better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to end up beaten black and blue by her family. Then the master said, Do you hear what that, ju that judge, correct as he is, is saying? So what makes you think God won't step in and work justice for the, his chosen people who continue to cry out for him? Won't he stick up for them? I assure you he will. He will not drag his feet. But how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on earth when he returns? This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Be to God. This particular parable is, and, and, is, and the Gospel of Luke is full of more parables than any other uh, gospel. Uh, and they, these are part of what uh, scholars call the traveling parables. Meaning Jesus is on the road, he's not in his home base, he's on the road and he's constantly teaching and healing uh, and having discussions like this uh, with his disciples. And that's basically from Luke chapter 9 all the way almost to the end where we're in Luke 19. Almost right before he comes back to Jerusalem uh, and for the last time. Prior to this parable, Jesus talks about the second coming. Now, we've all heard that phrase before, right? The second coming of Christ. Of course, he mentions it in this parable as well. But he acknowledges that before the end actually comes, before that second coming, people will grow impatient. We've never been impatient before, right? <laughs> oh, Sam, I missed your laugh. So <laughs> we've never, we've never grown impatient. You've never been impatient, right? What is impatient? Impatient basically means like, you know, you, you, can't, you can't stand waiting on something to happen. you got to figure it out and do it right away, right? Now, the people in Jesus' day were waiting, of course, after and his disciples were kind of expecting the second coming to happen right away. And, you know, we've been hearing about it for centuries, right? Waiting for the second coming, but have we gotten impatient? Waiting on God. They did in Jesus' day. They got impatient. And when Jesus ascended, they got impatient. In fact, they got impatient while he was here, hoping that he would just raise up arms and let's go storm the storm the empire and let's kick Rome out. People get impatient. It's a natural thing. It will be easy for people to lose confidence in God and quit praying. Now, have we ever gotten to a point where we got so impatient that we forgot to pray to God or we quit praying to God? It happens in this world. Jesus is encouraging His disciples to keep praying with conviction. Meaning, don't pray just for out of obligation. Pray for what you want to happen. Pray for it. Pray with all that you have. In spite of dark and difficult times you may be living through or may be coming around the corner. So in the parable, Jesus gives us two characters. 
Here we, we don't know their names. We have, we're not given actual names of who these people are. But they couldn't be more opposite than each other. Okay, so I want you to, to imagine a boxing match. How many of you ever seen a boxing match? Okay, how many of you ever seen Rocky before? <laughs> a real boxing match is nothing like Rocky. Okay? <laughs> I, I have to admit, I, I, I remember the first time I watched the... I, maybe I shouldn't watch sports that I really don't know much about. Because the first fight I ever saw was Evander Holyfield and Mike Tyson. We all know how that went. Okay? So, anyway, it's nothing like what it is in Rocky. Although Rocky is good be entertaining, right? So imagine in, the, in this corner, we have a judge, okay? Now, when we hear the word judge, we imagine somebody probably dressed in a black robe, sitting up high up on a, on a pedestal and looking down over the courtroom and making decisions, right? We have a judge, and it's not like the judges in the Bible, right? Judges in the Bible didn't, didn't do that. They didn't wear robes, they didn't sit behind the bench and you know, would cast out decisions. So this judge is nothing like the judges in the Bible who were considered wise and reputable individuals and commissioned by God to shepherd God's people. And they had a healthy fear of only God. And when you fear God, that's actually wisdom. That equals wisdom. This judge neither fears God or cares at all about what people think. Have you ever met anybody like that? Trust me, there are people in the world a lot like that. He is more of a judge of the state. Meaning somebody gave him this job, he was appointed to it. The problem is he hates his job, obviously, because he doesn't like dealing with people. And he's obviously unfit to do this job. We, again, we don't know his background, we don't know if he's had training or anything, but he obviously doesn't like what he's doing. And he definitely doesn't like the person in the other corner, the widow. Now remember, okay, so, so we have the judge here, and then the other corner, the challenger, is the widow. Right, let's say the judge is the, is the reigning champion. Then we have the widow who is the challenger. A widow who has neither power nor authority in this story. The only thing she has is persistence of coming to this judge and saying, I have been wrong, I seek justice. In the Bible, widows symbolize powerlessness and vulnerability. Therefore, throughout both the Old and New Testament, there are demands and laws that say we have to take special care of the widow. Even Jesus talks about caring for the widows. In the early church, though, being a widow was considered a, as much as they can be an honorable, had an honorable place in the church. More than likely, they went out to take care of those who needed help, others like them who needed help. Though vulnerable, she is bold. Right? She is bold. This is a very patriarchal society she's living in. And yet she has no husband to back her up. He has passed. We don't know her family background. We don't know if she has kids or family. We don't even know if she has any money. But she's bold enough to come probably on a daily basis, if probably not hourly basis, to this judge and say, I need justice. I have been wrong. And she is relentless in her demand for justice. So after, let's imagine this fight is going round after round. I, I don't know, I can't remember, is it 12 rounds in a boxing match? Is that the... At the max, I think. Let's imagine they have gone to round 11. He's got some good punches in, she's got some even better punches in. But nobody is actually winning or has the upper hand. Until the judge finally gives in. He says he will render her justice because he is a, he has no fear of God, but he is afraid of this widow. I better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to end up beating black and blue up from her penalty. Now, just, just think about that for a minute. You have a judge, how corrupt he is. You have this poor widow who, who knows how long ago, how long she's been a widow, who doesn't have much, but yet is persistent, and he is afraid of getting beaten up 
by her. I bet you this guy has thought about it. He doesn't even go home because he's afraid to walk outside and meet her in a dark alley. In the movie Rocky II, Apollo Creed has, has just won by unanimous decision the, at the end of Rocky I the bout with Rocky Balboa. Yet he was shaken by it. He never, nobody had ever gone the distance with him. He got knocked down a few times. In fact, he even told Rocky, I don't want a rematch. But then after people kind of smearing his name, he said, all I want to do is fight Rocky Balboa. He wants a rematch with nobody else. Yet other top contenders are willing to pay extra money to have this title shot. All he wants to do is fight Rocky, who has been distanced and kind of a ghost for the last six months. Nobody knows if he's even been training. But all he wants to do is fight Rocky Balboa. He's gathered with his entourage and his trainer in the room, and then his trainer keeps piping in. We've got other contenders. You're going to make more money. You are the champion. You beat this guy. Why do you want to fight him again? And finally, he asks his trainer, what is it? Why don't you want to fight him? His trainer walks up, looks, and Apollo sits at the desk, looks right at him and says, if you want honesty, I'm going to give it to you. He says, he's not the right guy for us to fight. He says, you beat this man like I've never seen any other human being get beaten before. But he kept coming at you. Meaning you can't beat him to a pulp to win. Because he's going to fight back. He said, this is not someone we want around in the ring or in our life. Let it go. Apollo just simply looked and he said, thank you for his honesty. He says, Fine. <coughs> Typical male, right? <laughs> Just wants to fight even though his, everybody around him is saying, do not get back in the ring. The image of black and blue pounding reminds me a lot of the Rocky movies. How many times did we see Rocky Balboa get up and he couldn't even see out of his eye? He, had, he was black and blue, but he always kept fighting. He was persistent. On paper, this should not have been a contest. The judge has all the power at his disposal, and, and in this situation, he has everything. This widow has nothing, but she has been wrong. We don't even know what crime has been committed against her for her to keep doing this, but it obviously is something that bothers her. The widow used the only weapon she had left where she gave every ounce of her being. And she fought with persistence. Have you ever met somebody who has persistently come to you and you finally give in to them? Just so you don't have to deal with them anymore? <coughs> Did that work? One thing I know about persistent people, they keep coming back. Just like Rocky Balboa, they keep coming back. They keep getting up. But this is what Jesus tells the disciples. This is what we have to pray about. We have to be persistent. We have to constantly do it. To not only get what we want, but to pray to God for things to change, to become better. But you know, notice the parable doesn't end there. Jesus says God will render swift justice to His chosen ones who are crying out to Him day and night. Meaning God's going to step in and give this woman justice. Even though the judge has said, fine, I need to make amends with her or whatever, so she's like, she, she'll quit bothering me. But God's ultimately the one that's going to bring about justice for this widow. The heart of this whole passage is that plea for justice. Again, we don't know what she's seeking justice about. But she fights with every ounce of her being. No, it's not a physical, like, actual boxing match with, with the judge. But she's giving everything she has 
to seek justice. Notice Jesus concludes the parable about justice and prayer with the, that leaves us with a question. Will he find faith on earth like that when he comes back? Think about Jesus during his lifetime. He rarely found faith like that during his lifetime. Look at how many didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Look at how many questioned everything he did, including his 12 closest followers. They hung him on a cross because they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe in who he was. So what kind of faith did they have back then? But Jesus promises he's coming back. The interesting thing about Jesus when the disciples constantly ask him, when is when's all this going to take place? You notice he never gives them a direct answer. The closest thing to a direct answer is that only God, the Father, knows. Meaning Jesus, the only Son of the living God, does not even know when these things are going to take place. He just knows that they will. And God, when God says that it will happen. But yet, the disciples kept pushing and pushing because they are human beings. How many of us like to know things up front rather than finding them out later? Yeah. Right. Imagine again being in the boxing ring. I'd like to see somebody throwing a punch at me rather than behind me. I'd, rather, I'd like to see it coming. Whether I can stop it or not, I'd like to see it coming. How often in life does that not happen? Do things happen and we're not ready for them or we didn't see that coming? Jesus is giving His disciples a warning with this. It's not said literally in the text, but it's there. He's basically saying, be prepared, be ready for when that time comes. A trainer in boxing would never tell their fighter to keep your guard down, would they? So what's going to happen in a boxing match if you're asked to keep your guard down. You're going to get hit. right? And you may not get back up in 10 seconds. Or however long the countdown is. But Jesus says, be ready. Be on your guard. Be on your watch. I can't guarantee it's going to happen in our lifetimes, but it's going to happen. Be ready anyway. Notice that Jesus said God will render swift justice. What's swift mean? Fast. Is that our fast or God's fast? We talked about this a little bit at Sunday school today about time. Time might mean something completely different to God than it does to us. Peter said in his letters, one day to God is like a thousand years to us. Well, I don't expect to be here in a thousand years. Either. So I'm not even going to make it one of God's day. But, we need to focus on what God's intentions are, not ours. We need to pray to God. We don't pray to each other. We pray to God for things to happen. And we need to have patience and trust for those things to happen. So when Jesus comes back, He'll find faith here on earth. Not like it was before where there seemed to be a lack of faith. Because who makes it to heaven? What does John 3.16 tell us? Anybody? Whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So meaning we have to believe, we have to trust in what Jesus is telling His disciples, even though we're thousands of years removed from when those words were first spoken and first written down. But we still have to trust and be patient for God's work to happen. How many times in your own lives have you decided, okay, what I've been doing my 
impatience is not working. I'm going to try to be patient, and it's worked out. Has that ever happened? Ever shaking their head? No. Nobody's ever been patient before. <laughs> How many of you turn over, turn things over to God and let God take care of it? Yeah. Yeah. Does it usually work out in some form or another? Right? Because God's got bigger shoulders than we do. God can do things that we can't even begin to scratch the surface of. God's the one that decides when Christ is coming back. God's the one that decides justice for this widow. God's the one that decides justice for all the world. God is the one that's got the whole world in His hands, right? The song doesn't say, Stanley, you've got the whole world in your hands. I don't think you want that power. <laughs> but God has that power. I'm sure there are times God would like to take a vacation. But God has that power. We don't. So trust in God. Be patient with God. And allow God to do God's work on God's time, not our time. And justice will be achieved by all of us through the hands of God. But we must continue to pray. Jesus tells us to pray without ceasing. Meaning be persistent. Never quit. Get back up and something knocks you down. Prayer is essential to faith and to God. It is through prayer that we will all receive justice. And that we can answer when God does show back up and sends His only Son back. And the second coming comes, whether we're here or not, but He'll find faith like He's never encountered before. But we first have to trust, believe, and pray to God. So, I ask the question, and something I want you to think about, what will God find when Christ returns? That choice is up to you. Our hymn of thanksgiving is on page 133 and on the screens. Uh, leaning on the everlasting arms. Again, the altar rail uh, is available for you to pray if you would like to pray. We'd be happy to pray with you. Uh, but it, that is open throughout our time together each and every week. Uh, so I invite us to please stand and join together in hymn 133.
you go from this space of worship today, go forth knowing that God is with you. Go forth knowing that God gives you wisdom. He gives you patience. He gives you all the tools that you need to go out to make this world a better place. Trust in God. Trust in each other. And trust that Christ will come again. Go forward in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.